Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Premier Pundit podcast. Of course, it's my good self, Mr. Ben Dinnery, and my esteemed co-host, Mr. Jason McKenna, in the house. Special edition. This is not just your defensive assets ahead of game week. Is it 28, Jason? Is that what we're looking at? Yeah. But we're also, there's a little birdie tells me that you may, you may be considering activating your wild card this week. Is it true, my good man? Well, that bird is well informed. I don't know where you get your sources from, Ben, but you're spot on once again. And in fact, not only have I been thinking, I have actually already played that wild card, uh, just played the wild card. It is amazing. It's exciting. <laughs> Look at his reaction here. I mean, wow. there's no going back now. It's it's wow. locked, signed, that sealed, is- delivered. <laughs> just blew, you've just blew my mind, Jess. Blew oh, my mind. Mate, I hope you can keep it together for this video because there is a lot of fun discussions here, a lot of serious ones as well, and no more serious than the reason why I'm playing the wild card. It's just been a dreadful few weeks for me. Um, a lot of assets that I feel aren't doing the bits, a lot of assets that I want to move on to and like the look of. And, yeah, there's no more so than my defensive kind of discussions here. Uh, Rudiger was one that I kind of plumbed for this game week. Got zero, didn't play. Pereira, I'm not liking Leicester at the moment. Uh, I do quite like my goalkeeper in Areola, but I'm kind of looking for some, you know, maybe differential and different ways to climb up the ranks. And I think Cancelo and Diaz are fine at the moment, but I was burned by Burn and Brighton, so... It is back to the drawing board. And so looking at this wild card, I've kind of gone with almost going back to my roots of looking at the data and looking at the best defences in the league so far this season, but then trying to contextualise it with what is happening at the moment. So the top four goalkeepers so far this season in terms of best goals against per 90, Edison sits at the top at 0.67 against per 90. But I think he's a little bit too expensive for me. And also that limits if I want to get in a Manchester City asset, maybe up top or maybe in defence or midfield. So I've kind of not plumbed for that one at the moment. Now, Mendy, I think, is an interesting one. And we'll get on to Chelsea discussions in a minute. But since he's been in the Chelsea team, 0.67 goals against per 90. Fantastic data there. Then Robert Sanchez of Brighton, one goal against per 90. I think that is a fairly interesting one, but just because over the last few game weeks, we've discussed how good Brighton are data-wise, but they're not matching it on the pitch. And then the fourth best is, I think, the, the darling of the FPL community so far this season, Emiliano Martinez, 1.4 goals against per 90. But I also do still have those reservations over Aston Villa and then just quickly before I get on to what I think my choices are and we can discuss this through Ben but I thought it would be quite interesting to look at who the top 10k have in their teams what is the template there Martinez is out and out the absolute favorite with 79.52 percent of the top 10k owning him as goalkeeper then going through the rest of the defensive assets Stones 59.35% owned, Cancelo plus 50%, Diaz 45%, Matty Target 24%, Dallas 67%. So he is actually the most owned in the top 10K. Very interesting. Cresswell at 17%, Rudiger 11.95%. So I don't actually feel that embarrassed that I've got him in now. And then Digne at 22%. Looking at those initial top 10K there, obviously these people know what they're doing because they're in the top 10K. But are there any surprises there, Ben? Any that you wouldn't actually own? Um, I think Rudiger's still a, a difficult pick for me. Um, the, the tinkerer, Tuchel, um, and he's at a price point where if you did bring him in and he did get benched, yeah, it's a disappointment, but you haven't invested too much money. He's not a chill well, for example, like me good self. You know, he's not what considered one of those maybe premium um, buys. I was very surprised at, at the Dallas 
particularly his ownership at, at that percentage. I suspect you know that comes with um, Marcel Bielsa playing him out of position, playing him in that midfield role, and obviously picking up a couple of goals in recent matches because it certainly isn't uh, in that squad for Leeds defensive returns. Uh, because I just couldn't, you know, I just couldn't count on them, you know, to keep a clean sheet. And um, and who else did I like in there? Yeah, it's you know, it's it's easy to see why the Manchester City players are you know, attract a lot of attention. But again, for me, you know, and I'm I'm Conchillo and Diaz. It comes down to we've got Champions League kicking off again, and we'll have FA Cup matches coming up. You know, we've seen Pep rotate. We're on a back to back double game week. And I don't know. I'm I'm thinking about maybe you know getting rid of of one of my defenders and and looking at Edison. Yes, he might be a little bit expensive in terms of, of what you're getting, but at least you know he, you know if he's fit and he's available, he starts. And and ultimately, we're coming to the stage of the season where you can't really afford too many mistakes. You know where we've got maybe. 10 game weeks left and you know it, it's, it's a, it is the business end so if you do make mistakes and it does start to cost you in your league you haven't got much time to turn it around so you know when we're looking at these these fixtures on um, and these double game weeks you need to try and maximize your returns and try to sort of lock in and and maybe it's maybe time to play a more conservative approach to the fantasy game unless you know, you really need to sort of claw something back and you want to go out on a limb and you want to take a, a bit of a punt. Yeah, this is the interesting thing and that's why I am looking at the top 10K kind of template there because it is template, it's boring, but they're getting it right. That's why they're up there and it just kind of almost protects your team maybe to make one or two differential choices to claw up the league just a little bit, but there is that protection bubble. So yeah, I do want to turn the... T- attentions to Chelsea because as you said there Rudiger being dropped this week was a big knock for me because I thought he he was a great way into arguably the best defense in the league since Tuchel has come into charge the the side have been absolutely fantastic seven clean sheets in their last eight games 4.15 xg conceded ridiculous numbers there from the Blues and also Tuchel himself now has the record for the first Premier League manager to get a clean sheet in his first five home games. This is no mean feat, and also this is no anomaly. Chelsea's data is amazing. So with lots of clean sheets there, I really want to tap into that. And I've kind of gone down almost your thinking, but with Mendy instead of Edison, I'm thinking there's two options now at Chelsea that are kind of nailed. But then I don't even know if Aspel Equator will be nailed. I know that Mendy will not be dropped. There's no reason why he would be dropped. Aspel Equator, though, I mean, with Zuma, with Christensen, with Thiago Silva, there's a lot of competition there at the back. And I thought, well, Rudiger, because of the German connection, maybe Tuchel kind of saw him as somebody that he can kind of get his ideas through to much easier. But then behind the scenes, on the training ground, he's probably working with a lot of these and so even Aspel Equator is just a little bit too far for me. So at the moment, in my current kind of squad that I've got together, it's actually Mendy between the sticks. No Aspel Equator in defence because I'm thinking I'm giving myself that Chelsea coverage. I know that Martinez is kind of 79% owned, but we will get on to my worries about Aston Villa, but also they're about the same price now because I, I haven't had Martinez through this season because his price has gone up and up. They're about the same. And I think going towards the end of this season with the personnel that they have, I expect Chelsea to kind of almost match or, or maybe beat Aston Villa in that sense. So do you think that the Mendy kind of option is a good one just to kind of protect me from Aspel Equator, Rudiger or any of these players being dropped? Yeah, good safe option. Uh, I wouldn't talk anybody out of, of, of Mendy. You know, I think you make a good point. The one kicker for me, maybe the Edison Mendy scenario. I mean, is Mendy on penalties? That's the big question. Ooh. You know, you're, you're not you're not getting the spot kick duties. Uh, <laughs> you know, guarantees that Edison may have. 
Oh, see, now you're making me reconsider again because the next discussion point that we do have to bring up is the Man City defensive double up because, as you said there, which ones to go to? Cancelo, third most XGI of all defenders so far this season. And I like Diaz. I think he's actually more nailed than any of the Manchester City assets. So my kind of discussion point in my head is Diaz plus whoever else. Cancelo seems to be the logical choice because he's getting in the midfield, he's out of position in a Manchester City team that have done amazing kind of attacking numbers, especially recently. I think Cancelo himself, amazing numbers, and that's why you know he's up there as one of the most creative players defensively so far this season. But as you said there, there is a real concern, the Pep Roulette for one, but also the fact that Man City are trying to go for a historic quadruple. I think that they're so far in the league now that Pep has got that little bit of leeway, that ability to kind of go, right, I'm going to rest some of my best players for these games that are going to be tighter so that I can concentrate Champions League, FA Cup. It's it's just realistic. And we know what Pep is like. We know how well he manages the squad because he's top of the league at the moment. I think Cancelo is a little bit of a worry for me, but there is so much potential there. What What is kind of your thoughts and mindset there? Is that just a little bit too much to trust in a defensive double up each week? Um, I mean, there's a couple of things to consider. Uh, it, it's a bit of a conundrum for, for those within the fantasy community because the, the biggest concern or, or worry for us looking at that City defence uh, or, or City lineup generally, when Pep's making changes, albeit, you know, it could be wholesale changes as well. We've seen it five, six changes a week. There's very little, um, you know, change with regards to output. City's still producing the results. If City went out and made massive amounts of changes and got beat, you know, great. You would almost say, well, Pep will revert to that perceived, that or that perception of his strongest eleven, we just don't have that, and particularly in that back four, or maybe it's even a back three on occasions. You know, if you just look at you know, some of the options at his disposal, left back Zinchenko, you've got Mendy who hasn't even had a look in. Then you've got Cancelo. If he starts Zinchenko, he then sometimes goes with Cancelo on the right. Um, if he doesn't start Kyle Walker, who can also come in on the right, and therefore Cancelo can maybe move into midfield or even play as a false 10. Centre-back, wholeheartedly agree that Ruben Diaz is, of all of those centre-backs, the, the defender that looks most nailed and likely to start a game. But who do you play alongside him? We've seen great performances from John Stones this season. I am a report has forced himself back into the thing and after his recovery from injury. We've also seen Nathan Aki back in full training now. You know, will he get an opportunity to come on and get some minutes under his belt? And I know there's not a not a lot of room in football for sentiment, but you look at the minimum number of appearances, for example, and we assume that City are going to be going, you know, crowned Premier League champions. There is a minimum requirement from players within the squad that they have to, you know, surpass that threshold to qualify for a winner's medal. You know, does that then come into the equation? And it's it's not like Nathan Aki is a bad centre back. We're talking about, you know, a Dutch international who's come in. Um, for around in and around 40, 45 million pounds. So, you know, he's, he's, he's more than capable of playing at that level. If I was going to do the double up, I would definitely have Diaz as the anchor. And I think it would have to be, for me, it would have to be Cancelo. And the only reason being is because he offers that additionality in terms of maybe that uh, offensive returns. You know, if he plays a little bit higher up the pitch, um, we've seen in the Champions League, um, you know, what he can deliver higher. I think he, he two assists in, in uh, Manchester City's first uh, knockout game of the uh, of when the competition sort of restarted, and he was superb. And it it would be um, those, uh, you know, the potential of Cancelo playing up there. On the understanding that maybe you know he's not going to start every game, but he can hopefully you know aggregate a better return over a period of fixtures and maybe some of those other players in the back line. 
Yeah, this one is definitely going to the wire for me. I think a strong bench will help and allay some of those concerns, but it is a realistic thing that it's a big investment in somebody. Cancelo, I think, does start most weeks, but there is those real concerns, and I think Diaz is fine. There's there's no real concerns over him. So it is a real debate in my mind. But I do have some other options that I'm going to talk through, some cheaper ones, some maybe differential ones and some that I think, you know, that I have to have in my squad. Now, I'll move attention actually to a differential one for the time being. And I'm really liking the look of Fulham. Uh, six clean sheets in the last eight. They come into my thinking for sure. Ariola is my goalkeeper at the moment. I got him in a little while ago and thank goodness for that. I, you know, I've seen him for quite a few of those six clean sheets, whereas Southampton had just been letting in lots of goals. He's a fantastic, great budget keeper, no doubt about it. And I think maybe might be the best sub 5 mil slash 4.5 goalkeeper to own until the end of the season. He's in the top four for expected points since game week 17. But the team also have some great defenders as well. Uh, Aina, I think, is great as 4.5, highest XGI of all Fulham defenders. But I think I'm actually most... Attempted, uh, tempted by Tosin Adebayo. He is a great shout because he seems to have been unlucky so far this season with 16 shots in the box, which is the seventh most of all Premier League defenders this season. He's in the top four of FPL defensive assets since game week 17 in terms of expected points. And since game week 22, he's actually top for expected FPL points of all defensive players. So he's kind of top of the Fulham list, uh, along with Ariola as a cheaper goalkeeper, but it's how my squad is kind of filling out. I think in many senses, uh, Adebayo might be good instead of Aspel Equator because I know he'll be starting week in, week out. There is a difficult run of fixtures for Fulham. You know, they are bottom of the league table, but I think the way that they're playing at the moment, they're, they're going to be fighting to stay up, but also... The realistic thing is they've really turned things around. They're a top four. In some instances, they have been a top defence in the metrics for a while now. And they've got Man City next. Not going to downplay that one. That one's incredibly difficult. But then Leeds on their day aren't brilliant. Aston Villa, Wolves, Arsenal have been kind of devoid of chances. And Chelsea, yes, they've been great defensively. But going forward, they have been lacking a little bit recently. So... There are some cleanable fixtures in there going forward from now to game week 34. I kind of keep that six to seven game week measure in my mind as good medium to longer term picks. At his price, I can bench him so that I don't have to worry about that as well, can play other people in my team. I think that, you know, Adebayo or uh, Adebayo is, is quite a good one to have. And Ariola, I mean, what is your kind of thinking on those uh, Fulham assets, Ben? Yeah, look, I think if we're looking to bring in players at, at this point, and particularly wild Corden, um, I like the thought of, first and foremost, you have a team that is carrying a little bit of momentum, they're carrying a little bit of belief, that confidence is, is there. Um, and secondly, they've got something to play for, they've got something to fight for. Right and point. like I say, Scott Parker's got them well drilled. Um, so you know that when you go out on that pitch, you know, Scott Parker is going to go strong and his players are, you know, want to play in the Premier League next season. You know, they want to be in the top flight. They do want to go back down to the championship. And, you know, that's going to be a big factor in, look, yes, on paper, there are some maybe potentially some tricky fixtures, but, you know, and, and I'm not saying that, but, you know, you're Aston Villas, not going down, not qualifying for Europe. Um, you know, mid table is great, you know, uh, compared to what happened last season. Um, you know, is that desire there? Do they have that same fight in them? Or is it a case of, well, you know what, we've had a really good season, we're tired, given the quick turnaround, all of the fixtures. Um, does Dean Smith look at that? Maybe look, let, let's rotate a little bit. I think there's a lot of other factors that come into play at this stage of the season, which make it fairly unique. And, and Fulham are one of those ones that certainly, you know, tick a few boxes 
in terms of, well, actually, um, the old adage, you know, they're not going to be playing in their flip-flops just quite yet, which, you know, you could question maybe Jurgen Klopp is done now with his Liverpool team. You know, seven changes at the weekend. Clearly, um, the Champions League is a priority. And you also question the title's gone. That's that is even in a discussion point. But is he even thinking now that we cannot even qualify for the top four? And and maybe that's why he went the way he did and, and everything will be focused on, well, let's try and win the Champions League. Yeah, this is something that I will come on to tomorrow with the kind of only Liverpool asset that I have, the attacking kind of discussions. And as always, make sure to stay subscribed so that you can keep up to date with our opinions on all sorts of different facets with FPL. But I think this is the, the one of the most important points for me with Fulham is there's something there for them to play for, something huge. And I think until they've got you know, a six or seven point difference between them and the relegation zone. They're going to have something to fight for for the whole of this season up until game week 38. It might not be decided till the final day. And so that's a good thing. That means that they're going to come out there with fire in their bellies each week, something to prove, something to do. And I think that's a really important thing when you're looking at these FPL assets. And maybe this is might be why Aston Villa are not doing as well now. They come out of COVID. They don't have that thing to fight for. They're staying up, basically. Europe would be nice, but they've done their job for this season. And so, yeah, let's move on to Aston Villa then, because they've been phenomenal this season. Martinez topped this season with 53.8% clean sheet ratio, which on the surface, it does seem like he's essential. Aston Villa is essential. But then I have looked at the last eight game weeks and I feel they have ridden their luck. And how much of this can go on? Because they're overperforming XG. They've managed five clean sheets, but their defensive data is pretty poor. They've got the joint worst goal attempts in the box conceded over the last eight. Second worst total goal attempts conceded over the last eight. And 15th in the table for XG conceded. In my mind, yes, Martinez is an amazing goalkeeper. He's, he is brilliant. But you can only go so far with riding this data. So there is a lot to consider. Uh, the team are not on a great patch of form anyway in terms of attack or defence. The loss of Matty Cash cannot be overstated. He's been so good. And I think tactically he was a great buy for them in terms of giving their defence, that transitional ability to turn into attack and and that's kind of protected them a little bit. But yeah, the form is not on their side. The data isn't over the last eight, but they do have good fixtures coming up. And then the other thing, the thing that I mentioned at the start is they feature heavily in the top 10Ks kind of teams there. Target and Martinez are both highly owned. So for me, this is actually a real conundrum because the data is almost steering me away a little bit but then they keep getting clean sheets week in week out so I'm not sure if you can help me with that decision there Ben that maybe Tosin Adebayo might not be a good shout and actually just to stick with the safe bet of target you know what my thoughts are Jason on playing it safe (laughs) and go with templates what I you know I, I must have a little bit of Greek in my blood because I take that plate and I just smash it on the floor. You know, get rid of it. I I don't want to be a sheep man. I just want to keep things exciting. And I think, you know, maybe the introduction of, of, uh, you know, anyone from that full and back line is a, is a, is a good thing. Um, What have you got to lose really at this stage of the season? Um, For most people who, you know, you're not really going to threaten that top 10 K. Um, and you know what? If you finish five, six, seven hundred thousand, or you finish two, two and a half million, what difference does it really make? You know what? Go, enjoy it. Enjoy yourself. It's look. You're not getting. If you finish five hundred k, there's no bragging rights in that. If you finish two and a half million, well, you know, crap's crap. You have a bad season. <laughs> but so if you're gonna do it, let's like you say. Uh, have a little bit of enjoyment. Try something a little bit different. Maybe 
try some a, a different type of philosophy on your team selection. Maybe create some kind of blueprint that you maybe want to look to towards next season. You know, already plan for next season. For me, you know, I've made a lot of strange decisions, probably in people's eyes, but you know, inherently and in, in overall, I've I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed being different because when you look at you know, you have the weeks where average scores aren't really that good, but you're the man with a lot of differentials and the potential is there for you. Flip side of that, you know, your top 10K is smoking and I'm, you know, somewhere I'm in the, I'm in the distance, me, I'm, I'm gone. But look, that doesn't bother me. It, you know, it's, I'm not in this for bragging rights. I, I just enjoy playing and enjoy a bit of the crack and, you know, chewing the fat and what would be, would be. So I say, you know, go against it, Jay. Go against it. Just have a bit of belief in Do something a little bit different, mate. W- would you say YOLO or is that just a bit too far for you? Uh, a, you're, you're pushing a little bit, <laughs> there, to be fair. <laughs> it's just, yeah. No, he's spoiled it. Oh, no, no. That, that, that was a good emotional <laughs> moment there. And I, I've gone and spoiled it all by saying something stupid like YOLO. Yeah. So <laughs> so it, let's let's continue the trend. And, and this one's kind of going back to template almost. West Ham, strong unit. I think some people have kind of said difficult games coming up. But fourth best XG conceded in the last eight game weeks. And over the course of the season, arguably the fourth best defence in terms of XG conceded, fifth best for shots in the box conceded, and they don't let many big chances in either. I mean, people kind of talk about Brighton as one of the best defences data-wise. West Ham aren't far behind, but they're matching it. That's the difference between the two of those sides. The data shows that they're great. And I think the other thing that is big for me is it? it's a team kind of effort this season. Previous seasons, we've kind of seen that Fabianski has kind of kept them in there, saved them. But really, he's only had an XG prevented of one goal this season. So they're not hugely overperforming. They're just a damn good side. And I think they're markedly improved, obviously, since last season. But the other big thing for me, especially going towards the end of this season, is you know that those players are basically going to start week in, week out. There's none of this Rudica nonsense. There's none of this Manchester City kind of pep roulette wheel. You know that Cresswell, Kufal, Dawson are going to be there week in, week out, performing brilliantly, getting probably a clean sheet. And then for somebody like Cresswell and Kufal a little bit as well, assists, goal attempts, um, it's a great own. And I think Cresswell has got to be in my side. Best performing defender this season. What I'm most annoyed about is myself. And kind of going back to your point there, Ben, of getting in certain kind of ranks and this and that, is I think I've doubted myself a little bit too much this season because I've said many weeks, go for Cresswell, go for Kufal, great owns. And then I didn't myself. I don't know why. Gundogan, you said. and, And I agreed with you, but I didn't bring him in. So... I think I'm going to actually, maybe my change in ideology is back myself a little bit more. Go with these kind of picks because the date... Believe. Believe. Believe, Jason. Believe in myself. This is kind of almost our Star Wars. You know, you're you're Obi-Wan and uh, you're you're kind of giving me these... (laughs) This uh, force you're you're giving on to me as as your young Padawan here. Um, So, yeah, I think West Ham are a great one. I think you'd agree with that, wouldn't you, Ben? That they're a good side to own. 100%. And again, we talk about motivation. David Moyes, um, I think it was post-match, Leeds victory. He talked about, you know, obviously they're in the upper echelons of of that Premier League table. And uh, I think one of the reporters said, you know, do you you almost become complacent now that you're in and around that top five, top six and he went far from it. He says, you know, when we dropped out of the top four, he says that hurt. And the motivation, if anything, was even greater because we've tasted it and we want to get back. So, you know, as long as you can keep players fit like Mikel Antonio um, and you're getting a tune out of a rejuvenated Jess Lingard, you know, and, and built on that solid 
uh, back five or back is it a back seven? You know where you, you've got your two holding players. It's um, you know there were concerns when they lost Arthur Masuaku. They went from uh, I think it was like a five three two or with the two attacking wing backs, and I, I did have fears that that change in the system would maybe open things up a little bit too much. But that hasn't transpired, and they've they've dealt with his absence. Um, we coped better than I could ever have imagined. And yeah, look, I envisage a really strong finish to the season for David Moyes and West Ham and fully deserving of all the plaudits that they're currently getting. Yeah, this is the thing as well is I, I try and contextualise the fixtures that they've got up next that some people have said are difficult. I think Man United is obviously a hard one because it's away. It's at Old Trafford. But then, you know, some weeks they're, they're just not great going forward they could keep a clean sheet this weekend it could be a naught naught game kind of like um, we have seen Man United do against top teams but then uh, I wouldn't be surprised as Fernandes does well but then Arsenal Wolves Leicester Newcastle even Chelsea and, and Burnley are all coming up in the next seven game weeks for West Ham there's, there's a lot of cleanable ones in there I think I like this run of fixtures. I think, obviously, there's a few reds in there, Leicester and Chelsea. But then you look at the fact that there's big players missing from Leicester. I think they struggled this weekend. I didn't think that they were brilliant. Chelsea have not kicked on. And then the others, on their day, they blank, they underperform. They're not great. So I think this isn't a bad time to own West Ham in terms of attack, but especially defence as well. Now, I have to turn attention to somebody that I think this this one may upset you. Um, I think uh, this this could cause a little bit of an argument here, but he is provisionally in my squad. He's sitting there, nice and pretty, pretty good price tag. It's Mister Luke Shaw. I think due to the the chances he created, uh, he's got fantastic data. I think Man United have had Henderson between the sticks. I think you can kind of confirm more why De Gea is away and when we should expect him back. But honestly, I think Man United should and maybe might keep Henderson between the sticks now because they look so much assured at the back there now with him there. Since he's been there, they're matching slash overperforming XG conceded. Whereas this season when De Gea has been there, he's let in 3.1 more goals, expected goals, than he should have. Now, in terms of Shaw, he has a whopping XGI for this season. And in terms of it, since game week 19, 3.17. You can't just overlook that kind of data for a defender. Top for chances created over the last few game weeks, even if Man United aren't doing brilliantly. But for some reason, they're, they're actually consistent now. I do think that is related a little bit to Henderson coming in there, even though it's only for two games. But... They've got themselves a little bit more collective. They're going back to what I would describe as elite kind of defending that they were a season ago. And they were the third best defence behind Man, United, uh, Man City and Liverpool the season before. They're meeting those metrics now. They're, they're looking fantastic. And so I think it's not a bad shout at all with Luke Shaw. It's easy to see the appeal. Um, not for me, but that's just my own personal <laughs> preference. Um, I mean, the only other concern, and, and we've we've talked about this previously, is that um, you know, in and around congested fixture periods, Ollie does have another option there at left back in Alex Telles, who can come into the squad. And I think we've seen was it maybe Southampton that nine 0 victory. I think Shaw was one of those ones that was brought off at half time for Telles. So that's always a slight concern. Um, it's almost the Diaz and who else at City. It's the Shaw or, for me, the Juan Bissaka. You yeah, are getting some attacking returns with Juan Bissaka. Maybe not as much as, as what you are with Shaw, but what you are guaranteed um, is minutes and starts for Juan Bissaka. There's nobody really sort of threatening that right wing back or right back slot um, as... Uh, as, as much as the left but look um, yeah I, I, I see that and I see the appeal uh, just to pick up on your point with regards to David De Gea returned to Spain 
uh, following the birth of his, his first child. Initial reports suggested that I think De Gea would miss six games over that period. Basically, at the time, was every game up until the international break. However, um, you know, that might not be the case. Uh, the reason being, he's obviously elite level sports player and they don't have to go through the same, you know, um, protocols as we would in terms of returning back to the country. So it could be that, you know, he may not need to quarantine for that mandatory 10 day period. It could be that as long as he submits, you know, a negative swab, then he may be able to join his teammates, uh, you know, with immediate effect. So uh, his absence from football being a goalkeeper will not have as much of an impact as, you know, certainly one of those outfield players but again the con you know the the conversation will be had internally and, and, and Ollie will look at the performances of Dean Henderson and how he's you know grown into that number one goalkeeping jersey and making a real stake you know for his place in that side and not only that by the way but we're talking about well you, you then question if you're Dean Henderson regardless of how well I play Am I always going to be in number two? Do I feel I'm not getting a fair crack at the whip? And therefore, you know, what's the point in staying here? Um, but the caveat to that, um, and we've seen this slightly at Chelsea, although it was just for, um, I think it was one Champions League game, and then the, the, the stakeholders who are involved at the club, you know, the people who are holding the purse strings, We'll look at the fact that David De Gea is on, uh, I know it's in excess of maybe £200,000 per week. And if he isn't your first choice goalkeeper, how is that affecting his valuation in terms of any potential sell-on? So there are other factors that do come into play with regards to this. And it might be that, well, you know, Ollie's had pressure or conversations have been had and say, right, well, look, Dean Henderson is, is the future and he's done really well, but we need David De Gea to see out this season because if we get rid of him in the summer, we want to make you know ensure in this COVID-driven transfer market that we're getting as much as we possibly can. Because you know, teams will come knocking on the door and they go, Well, he's your number two now. Now I'm not giving you 70 or 80 million for your number two. Um that, and that could be the reality of the situation. And that's, you know, that, that was a thought process as well with, with keeping Kepa involved a little bit at Chelsea as well. You know, they try to make the, you know, give the the impression that he is on a par with with Mendy and, and they're trying to protect that value in whichever possible way because, you know, it, it's a, co a commodity and the finances these days are not once what, you know, they're not once what they were. It's an interesting discussion point. So just quickly, for peace of mind, would you get Wambaseka over Luke Shaw? Me personally, yes. Um, if uh, without me, without any prejudice, is I think Luke Shaw would, would be, just because he, he offers so much more in terms of a attack and returns. So focusing attention on somebody that I did consider in my thinking but then I do want to kind of give both sides here so Everton over the next seven game weeks have got the best run but I'm still not sold on them Newcastle the second best and obviously realistically no no insults here Ben but nobody's going to really be considering them or should be and then Wolves sit third and they do have a lovely green flurry of fixtures going on from game week 31 onwards they do have Liverpool next. That could be not as bad as kind of the fixture difficulty rating kind of indicates. And they do have West Ham in game week 30. But then I did a bit of number crunching. And although Wolves have collected three clean sheets in their last six matches, a lot of people are talking about they seem to have shored up at the back and that they're still... Um, that they're back on course to what they once were. But they're, they're still letting a lot of chances against themselves. They sit... At the bottom half of the table for XG conceded. They've got the second worst shots in the box over the course 
of the season. And in terms of the last, you know, uh, few game weeks, yes, they do have three clean sheets. But in total this season, they've only kept eight clean sheets. So it's like more of a, an anomalous run recently. They do regularly underperform their defensive data. And what I would also say is Patricio, for some reason, over the last few game weeks, has an XG prevented of three, which is incredibly rare for him. I think last season he had an XG prevented of minus one. And the season before that, it was like minus eight. He let in eight more goals than he should have. Not a very good goalkeeper. And I think the personnel at Wolves, with their problems, with their kind of adjusting to this new system without Doherty and, and things like that, it's still, I think, a, a little bit of a danger there. And kind of evaluating these games, these fixtures and things like that, I do think that somebody with a little bit more to play for as well, the likes of Fulham, West Ham, even Aston Villa, you know, they have better kind of data in the short term or at least over the course of the season in Villa's case whereas Wolves I feel have been quite lucky actually kind of looking at that is that something that you'd attest to as well Ben? Yeah I'm not, I'm not keen on Wolves in all honesty um, look I watched the game against Aston Villa they come away with a clean sheet and you might just say well you know a point against your, your local rivals in the back country derby uh, is a good result hugely hugely fortunate I mean um, we've seen um, Ollie Watkins hit the ball. We've seen, um, was it Konza hit the ball as well? You know, all within the opening sort of 10 or 15 minutes. Could have quite easily been, been two down there. Uh, other sort of guilt edge opportunities. So for me, I'm just not convinced with Wolves. Um, you know, and don't be fooled by those, you know, those greens in that fixture difficulty. Like I say, we've got. Fulham, something to play for. Burnley are getting dragged back into that that dog fight. You know they're going to have a lot on the line. West Brom could still be. You know if they put a couple of results together, uh, and Newcastle keep on getting beat, and Brighton do. You know they'll or Sam Allardyce will feel that they can still do something and, and spring a surprise. So for me, we'll come to the stage of the season where fixture difficulty almost becomes irrelevant. You know, I think you really need to do a little bit of research and, and do a little bit of your own thinking, not just, you know, what uh, maybe the official um, game fixtures tell us are easy games. It's it's never quite as simple as that. And just to end, uh, I've done a little bit of extra here. This has nothing to do with wildcarding, nothing to do. Just thought I'd throw some interesting stats out that I, I found in my research. And looking at Crystal Palace... I think it would be an interesting discussion point to end on what you think the reasons are for this. But last season, Geiter was one of the best goalkeepers in the league with a plus 7.4 XG prevented. He stopped seven goals from going in. This season, huge downturn, only so far. So there's still the rest of the season to go. He's prevented minus 8.9 goals. This is This is terrible. And that is actually the worst of any goalkeeper in the Premier League this season. Then I looked at some of the other kind of regressions in data for himself. His save percentage has reduced by 4.5%. So now he has the third worst save percentage in the Premier League. And this season, Crystal Palace have gone down from 26.3% clean sheet ratio per game to 21.4%. And I think maybe the biggest worry is this huge upturn in goals being conceded per 90 from 1.2 last season to 1.68 per 90 this season. Do you think, you know, we talked about this in the Monday injury data show, Crystal Palace are up there as one of the teams with one of the worst injury records. Is it, is it an injury problem or looking at that kind of downturn in data from Gaita? Is there just the downturn in quality of the personnel and the defence at Crystal Palace? Maybe even Guy to himself, he is getting older. Does he not have the ability that he once used to? Um, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer. I think, you know, depending... We did lose Wayne Hennessy, um, you know, early into the season to a, to a long-term injury. And Jack Butland didn't come in until January. 
and then he was he had a returned a positive COVID test. So really, where was the pressure coming from Gaeta for that that number one jersey? You know, I'm, I'm not saying that is fact, but it, it's maybe something to consider. And um, you also look at maybe how um, Crystal Palace set up, uh, and and there may be a, a perception for it to look at uh, a little bit more attacking, a little bit more adventurous when you know the introduction of Eze uh, to the team, um, and and maybe you know that belief, you know, where you had an, an all right season last year, the expectation levels are all of a sudden raised. We need to step up. Obviously, the keeping Wilfred Zaha is huge, but also, do you think, well, you know, to retain the services of Wilfred Zaha, do you almost need to be, well, actually, we need to start threatening for those European places and we need to start being a little bit more open. And that in itself, you know, creates a different mindset, a different philosophy. Um, the pressures on a goalkeeper and on a back four are different. You know, if you're conceding a goal or things are really tight um you know it's in the mind of of the goalkeeper and those players because it went you know when you're in that back third you make a mistake and it's a big mistake you know large proportion of the time it ends up in a goal you know a goalkeeper kind of isn't afforded the luxury of making mistakes because it's a goal and and so there's that you know he's, he's very experienced goalkeeper um, and we've seen in terms of longevity, you know, players being able to compete at the highest level at some of, you know, look at Buffon. I mean, he might be a, a, an anomaly to that, but, you know, he's... So there's, there's lots of examples of goalkeepers being able to, to perform, you know, late 30s, early 40s, without any kind of dramatic drop in performance. Sometimes it's like I say, it just isn't easy to sort of pin things down. They've had an unsettled back four, so you don't have that level of cohesion, that understanding. We've seen Van Arnhold and Mitchell at, at, at left back, we've seen Klein and Warren at right back. In centre back, you've been playing Kuyate, who's predominantly been seen as a defensive midfielder, central midfielder for most of his career, sit in that back line for a large proportion of the games, and then those other defensive. Partners have been made up of Sacco, injured, Dan, in and out, Gary Cahill, in, injured, out. So, you know, there's there's Tompkins, injured. Um, so it's never easy. And like I say, there's, there's probably a little bit of misfortune in there as well, but a lack of continuity would certainly contribute to that and, and just the different pressures of the game. So that is all that we've got time for today with this fantastic wildcard discussion here. And I look forward to tomorrow's show where we talk about the attacking assets and hopefully how I crawl my way to a respectable FPL position. But I thank you for your time, Ben, for your thoughts and giving me the ability to, to maybe calm my nerves. But what I will say as well, just make sure to like, share and and subscribe to Premier Injuries. We're doing daily content at the moment, Monday to Friday. We've got some great stuff coming up through the week. As you know, we've had the Monday Injury Data Show. We've had our discussions with Fantasy Doctor, Dr. Raj, but we've also got things just for you. We've got our five questions from you in a special show that will come out on Friday morning just to kind of allay any fantasy premier league fears but for now so i hope you stay subscribed so that you stay tuned for tomorrow's show on the attacking assets but you're also here for next week and beyond going through the season and into the next one and i'll just hand it over to big ben himself to sign us out yeah thanks jason really enjoyed that um almost tempted to, to pull the uh, the old whale card myself but we'll see what happens Ooh. on Wednesday with discussions around those attacking assets. But yeah, hope you guys yeah, took a lot away from that. Some great insights, some great data, some great differentials. So yeah, it's got the old grey matter ticking over. But for <laughs> now, <laughs> that's all, folks. 